A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The people of Judah and the citizens of Jerusalem said, Come, let us contrive a plot against Jeremiah. It will not mean the loss of instruction from the priests, nor of counsel from the wise, nor of messages from the prophets. And so let us destroy him by his own tongue. Let us carefully note his every word. Heed me, O Lord, and listen to what my adversaries say. Must good be repaid with evil, that they should dig a pit to take my life? Remember that I stood before you to speak in their behalf, to turn away your wrath from them. Verbum Domini. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. You will free me from the snare they set for me, for you are my refuge, and to your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. I hear the whispers of the crowd that frighten me from every side as they consult together against me, plotting to take my life. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Evangelii secundum Mateum. Gloria As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves and said to them on the way, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and crucified. And he will be raised on the, last, on the third day. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee approached Jesus with her son and did him homage, wishing to ask him for something. He said to her, what do you wish? She answered him, Command that these two sons of mine sit, one at your right and the other at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus said in reply, You do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the chalice that I am going to drink? They replied, We can. He replied, My chalice you will indeed drink, but to sit at my right and at my left, this is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard this, they became indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus summoned them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones make their authority over them felt. 
but it shall not be so among you. Rather, whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just so, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Verbum Domini. This morning's first reading from Jeremiah 18 is part of a section from Jeremiah 11 through 20. And in that section, Jeremiah speaks 10 complaints to God. Now, recall that at the beginning of the book, when the Lord called him, probably around the year 627, BC, he said, I'm too young. And the Lord said, Don't worry about that. I'll make you a, a brass wall and you know an iron door and you'll be all right. Um, but then by the time this is occurring, which is a good 35 years later, that he begins to complain a lot. As a matter of fact, so much so that there's a word in English called Jeremiad. A Jeremiad is a person who complains bitterly. In Yiddish, it'd be a schnorr, but here it's a Jeremiad. And he's a model for that. And it's a complaint that comes because he is doing what the Lord God told him to do. And because of his precise obedience to God, he gets in lots of trouble, and he does not like it one bit. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Now, this is very much, uh, his thinking, that is, is very much in line with the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, if you obey my commandments, I will bless you. If you break my commandments, I will curse you. And the curses are very specific sets of punishments that come about because you disobey me. But the blessings are also very specific rewards and prosperity if you obey me. That's Deuteronomy. Jeremiah is very influenced by Deuteronomy. Even some of the style of the writing, especially when they're talking about events in Jeremiah's life, very influenced by the kind of style of writing in Hebrew from Deuteronomy, because that's the way he thinks. You do God's commandments, you get blessed with all kind of good stuff. Break them, you get cursed. Well, he would expect the people he's preaching against to get the curse and that he would be fine. But he finds, as we see today, that the people in Jerusalem are contriving a plot against Jeremiah. And as a matter of fact, look at their thinking. Nothing bad will happen if we kill him. This, by the way, is you know, not their first. It's about their seventh or eighth plot against him, trying to kill him. Earlier in chapter 11, his own relatives tried to kill him because they so detested the word of God that he was speaking. And for that reason, for doing what was right, they couldn't stand it. And this is something that we need to pay attention to. I don't know if you've seen it, but there is what they call in the computer world a meme out there in the internet and Twitter and such that Christians are simply to be referred to as the haters. We're the haters. That's why they speak of us on a regular basis 
because we disagree with the various kinds of immorality that are becoming popular with politicians and such. And therefore, if we disagree with them, we must be haters. And the more you listen to some of it, you say, wait a second. The tone of anger and desire for revenge and getting back because these people dare to disagree with me on what I think is my right to be immoral the way I want to be in a society where the Supreme Court constantly emphasizes you have absolute freedom to do whatever you want. And don't give me virtue. Don't talk about your virtues. You must be haters. You hear the tone, and you begin to see, wait a minute. We may not be the haters, but the ones who call us the haters or may just be projecting their own hatred onto us. Pay attention to that as you hear various things. And think back on Jeremiah. Now, I want you to think about Jeremiah get, you know, uh, also just mention what the uh, reason. They said, look, if we kill Jeremiah, the priest will still give their instruction, even though in his day, he, a priest himself, remember that, Jeremiah's a priest, he was criticizing the priests because they were allowing and sometimes even encouraging a mixture of paganism with their Judaism inside the temple. And that mixture was something he criticized. But they said, well, if we get rid of him, that won't stop their instruction, as bad as it might be. Nor will it be a lack of counsel from the sages, the wise people. No, losing him won't mean that we lose the wise people or the other prophets who ended up being false prophets who said, oh, everything's great. You guys are doing well. Don't you worry about a thing. That Jeremiah, he's the one that's going to be shown to be the false prophet, though for the most part we don't know their names because they were all wrong. In Jeremiah's name we know because he spoke the authentic word of God. And so let us destroy him by his own tongue We'll pay attention to everything he says. We will catch him in something. You almost think that he was running for office. <laughs> and that's why Jeremiah prays. And first asks, Lord, listen to me. Listen to what my adversaries say as well. Listen to me. Know my words. And listen to what they're saying. Must good be repaid with evil? that they should dig a pit to take my life. So he's saying they're the ones who are really at fault. Are you paying attention? Have you forgotten about what I'm doing for you and that this is what they're doing back? I'm trying to save their souls, and they're just hating me. So are you listening to that, God? I sort of assuming that maybe he wasn't. And one of the problems with Jeremiah is that he also asks that the Lord kill them. Now, this is where we also say that he wants to punt the curses of Deuteronomy brought down on his enemies. And Jeremiah was a man of his time. But something that we see that's very different, and the reason we have that reading is because of today's gospel, beginning with Jesus' third prediction of his passion. It's the third time he predicts that he's going to suffer. He's going to be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes. They're going to give him over to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are going to torture and kill him. And then he'll rise. Notice, he does, throughout his trials, he takes Jeremiah another step. He goes another level. He doesn't say any curses. You're going to all burn in hell for killing me. No. His words are, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. His words and attitude will not be to curse his enemies, but will be to die for them, to take them out of their sin. 
His concern is for the people who torment him. This is why it is awesomely edifying, not just edifying. Edifying is so weak a word. When you hear Christians from Iraq and Syria who've lost everything and continue to pray for the ones who did this to them. That is exactly the living with Christ. And one of the issues that goes on as the wife of Zebedee, Zebedee is mentioned by name, and he appears twice in the Gospels, you know, when, well, actually just one time, but they mention it, where he's left behind. He stayed with the boat, probably sort of a rich guy because he had at least two boats, some hired men, plus his sons. And now his wife, who later on in the gospel will appear again, she will be at the cross. But right now, she interrupts Jesus' talk about the death and suffering. I said, wait a minute, what about my sons? What are you going to do for them? Make something nice for my boys. And that's probably, some of the moms here are laughing because they recognize the same impulse, perhaps. But, you know, Jesus turns from them. And you can't tell it in English because we have only one word for you. In Greek, you see the difference, you know, you know, tithelis, what do you, to a singular person, to the mom, what do you want? And then in, when he speaks to them, it's you plural, y'all. Okay. But he all went to the two boys. And he says, can you drink the cup I will drink? And they oh, sure, we're able. The Namtha, we can. Now, this is something that they don't know what they're saying. There's a great irony going on here. The cup throughout the Old Testament, except for one time in Jeremiah, in fact, where it refers to a cup of consolation, all the other uses of the cup in the Old Testament refer to the cup of God's wrath, the cup of punishment, over and over again, especially in Isaiah. And Christ is not saying that, I don't deserve that cup, I didn't commit any sins, he's the one man without sin. But this is my cup that he's taking. And he says, can you take it with me? And this is very important for us to understand. Because Christ invites us to share in his passion in his way. Not, again, Jeremiah, we want to be like him, being faithful to speaking God's word in the face of our enemies. But we want to be even more like Jesus, who prays for his enemies, prays for the people who are killing him, intercedes for their forgiveness. And even when one of the thieves changes from having reviled Jesus to then saying, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And he says, you'll be with me in paradise this day. That Jesus gives us another model. And he says, can you drink the cup? So yeah, we can. So he says, then you will drink the cup. You will enter into my suffering. And he wants us to enter into it his way, such as we saw with St. Stephen, the first martyr, who said the same words of Jesus, into your hands I commend my spirit, Lord. This is what the, the call of drinking the cup and union with Christ is. And he said, you'll be a servant like I'm a servant. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. That's what you're going to do. You are going to be in union with me. And that that union with Christ is not only that he saves us, but we, be, we are joined to him and belong to him and are like him by the grace he gives us to be like him. This is going to be the task of James and John. And again, it's the irony that James and John don't light the cup. They run away in Gethsemane and they don't show up at the cross. It's their mother, Salome, who does appear at the cross. St. Mark mentions her name. St. Matthew just says it's the mother of 
James and John, sons of Zebedee. And she also is one of the women who is there to bury him. And she's one of the women at the morning of the resurrection who goes to the tomb. So ironically, she who is seeking a favor lives out drinking the cup. And she also is a model for us that we do the same. 